All right, everyone. So let's uh, let's start. And uh, so let's see what we have. So. Uh, <coughs> First question, in order to get rid of resentment, uh, uh, one only think and consider the good qualities uh, of the other, even though their actions may sometimes be painful and hurtful. How does a layperson overcome that pain caused by the other? Okay, so, um, the, um, so, the, so the idea is that uh, um, we don't actually deny the negative qualities. Yeah, we know that the negative qualities are there. It's not about denial as such, but it's more about what we focus on at any particular time. But we know that all people are capable of bad actions. Everyone is capable of these things, and so sometimes these things will happen. And so it's often it is like a multi-pronged strategy. Yeah, strategy of many kinds. One part of the strategy is to focus on the good qualities of the person. Uh, but the other part of the strategy is also to know that if someone is very painful, difficult to be around, then you take actions yeah, to counteract that. Uh, and the sort of actions you would do is maybe not hang around that person so much, uh, yeah, not spend so much time with them, uh, understanding that your, your, kind of your own energy, your own ability to be kind gets depleted if you spend too much time with them. So you kind of hold back a little bit on that interaction. And so it's always important to have a sense of compassion for oneself and understanding what your limits are. Yeah. So you take kind of the appropriate and instead you hang out more with the BGF crowd. Yeah. You come here and you hang out with the good calamitas. That's kind of the, the idea. So we don't become stupid just because we are kind and compassionate. In fact, we become more wise by being kind and compassionate. That's the that's the idea. Uh, but it helps already if you can uh, focus on the good qualities of the other person. Actually, the pain becomes less already because uh, it means that a lot of the pain is in the mind. Uh, yeah, the kind of because of our thinking, because of our reaction. So if you react in a better way, it actually causes less pain right there. Uh, okay, let's go move on to the uh, next one. Dear Ajahn, I appreciate your clarification on the following. Can we interpret the suttas in different ways and come to the same conclusion? Uh, what is a tadjo samanaharo? And to what extent does linguistic limitations affect our understanding of the suttas? Um, all right. So... Um, uh, can we interpret the suit as in different ways and come to the same conclusion? It, um, it depends on uh, not all interpretations are acceptable. Yeah? There are some interpretations that are kind of all right uh, and other interpretations that are not. Uh, and it's very important to not think that any interpretation is okay. So it depends. <clears throat> but uh, what is the case is that some suttas like the sutta we're talking about yesterday, the Majje sutta about the middle, the one about the seamstress and all of that, uh, that has, has a large number of interpretations, and they're all different ways of understanding the same thing. In that case, it is fine, but it has to be within the overall context of the Dhamma. Yeah? It has to be within the Dhamma context. Once you step outside of the Dhamma, then the interpretation will no longer be right. So you have to be careful uh, and uh, I know it's quite common sometimes people have their preferred interpretations of the suttas, uh, and sometimes they, those interpretations are completely wacky, yeah, and there is no way you're going to get enlightened with those kind of interpretations. Yeah, you are stuck. Yeah. You are taking the interpretation which leads you around sangsara for further eons if you take that interpretation. Uh, so don't take that one. Take the one which cuts sangsara short, not the one that lengthens sangsara. Sangsara is long enough as it is already. Don't try the shortcut interpretation here. Uh. Shortcuts usually leads to long, round detours. Uh, that's the problem with the shortcuts. Uh, so, um, yeah. So be careful. And uh, usually it is advisable, if you have doubts about interpretations, uh, to check with someone who has more knowledge than you, who has more experience, uh, and then get some ideas about what actually is, uh, is going on there. Uh. So what is Tadjo Samanaharo? So Tadjo Samanaharo is a phrase that is found in Majjhima Nikai 28. And uh, it basically means uh, uh, appropriate 
um, connection to something. Let's just, I'll bring it up so we can see it here. And this is why very wisely we have Sutta Central accessible. So we go to the middle length sayings of the Buddha, middle length sayings, go to Sutta number 28, uh, which is the longer sutta on the simile of the elephant's footprint. There it is. Uh, we have a few different translations, Bhikkhu Sujato, and we have Bhikkhu Bodhi, and we have Sudaso Bhikkhu, we have Ibi Horner. Yeah, I'm not so sure about those, I'll leave those to one side. Uh, I'll tell them I said that. Uh, <laughs> and uh, then we have the uh, Tadja Samanaharo. There you are, right? So we have the uh, uh, there we have the corresponding engagement uh, is actually the translation here by by Bhante Sujato. I don't know if you can see that. It's a little bit small on the screen. Let's see if I can blow it up a little bit. Blow things up without a bomb. So where are we? So there we are. Yeah, Tadjo Samanaharu, that's the Pali word that is referred to here. And this is the English translation just there, corresponding engagement. Um, so let's see what Bhikkhu Bodhi has for the same one. Uh, this is his translation. Uh, yeah, corresponding conscious engagement. So exactly the same translation there. Uh, yeah. Um, so engagement here, when things engage, that is what I said is attention. Yeah, when we engage with the object. Uh, and uh, that engagement then happens either because the object is so powerful that it penetrates the sense organ, so you have no choice. Uh, yeah, you hear Thor kind of making noises in the distance. Uh, yeah? When you hear Thor, it's very hard to kind of avoid hearing Thor, because Thor throws the hammer and then you hear the, hear the thunder. <clears throat> or it is an internal going out engagement. Yeah? We want to engage with the world. So there's a, either way, there's a corresponding engagement. Uh, and that engagement is a kind of attention. You're attending to the object. And that attention will then have all of these qualities. It is either imbued with desire or imbued with conceit or imbued with views. Yeah? Because it is imbued with that, it leads to papancha. And this papancha then is what drives all of this thinking. The mind never becomes peaceful. That's what we were talking about last time. This is basically tajja samanahado, corresponding engagement. I think samanahado here is... Uh, Engagement, the corresponding here is, is tajja, it's uh, born from that or something like that, I think is the literal meaning of tajjo, born from that, not born from that uh, meeting of the sense, yeah, so corresponding, if you like, that's kind of the, the idea behind this. So. so I don't know who came up with tajjo samanahara, I, I have suspicion who, who it might be, there's only a few people who I think will come up with the Pali words like that, so that's kind of... Uh, that's always nice. So. <laughs> uh, okay. <clears throat> then we have, to what extent does linguistic limitations affect our understanding of the suttas? Uh, and uh, this, I think, is a, is a very good point. Uh, yeah, because uh, uh, <clears throat> by linguistic limitations here, there's a number of things that uh, could maybe come under the idea of linguistic limitations. Uh, but uh, uh, you know, one thing which we might call is kind of a general um, literary limitations, because uh, the suttas have been passed down through two and a half thousand years, uh, and during those two and a half thousand years, there have been standardizations of the suttas. Uh, there have been small changes because of errors in transmission, or all these kind of things, uh, and we know that this has happened because the suttas in Pali are not exactly the same as the suttas. Uh, that are found in Chinese, ancient Chinese, for example. There are small differences between them. Not very great, which is kind of extraordinary. So that is one kind of limitation, that the text that we have it is not exactly the same as we had at the time of the Buddha. It's not verbatim the same, but it's close enough. Yeah? Many of the, I, the main ideas found there are still the same. Right? Then there is our ability to understand partly properly yeah? how... What is our basis for understand, understanding Pali properly? Yeah. And that is another thing, because at that time, the words will have a certain meaning. Yeah. These days, are we able to discover that meaning exactly? Sometimes not, yeah? because what we have is we have maybe other literature, we have dictionaries, we have the commentaries that explain what they mean, yeah. but it's never 100% 100% certain exactly what the Buddha meant by these things. Yeah. And so we have to kind of, we have to, 
come to approximation sometimes. Yeah, we have to have a pretty close. It is not bad, I think, to understand that we have, but it's never going to be 100% exactly what the Buddha meant by those things, because we can never really know exactly what the Buddha meant by specific words. So, so we have, but we have, and this is why the Buddha very often uses, when you read the suttas, you will see that very often he uses lots of synonyms yeah, for a word. And when he used a lot of synonyms, I think the, one of the main purposes of that uh, is because he knew that this is like a oral tradition. So many synonyms, it means that you get closer to the meaning of what is being said because you see it from many different angles, uh, many words kind of homing in on the actual meaning. Uh, and so that is often why the texts are very repetitive and lots of synonyms are used and many examples may be used, etc., etc. It helps us to uh, see these things. Uh, but of course, for many of us, we read the suttas in English, yeah, like we do here now. And that is another layer of abstraction or another layer of uh, uh, away from the original intention. First of all, you have the Buddha's insight. Yeah? That is the real thing. Then the Buddha has to express that insight in language. That is the Dhamma that he speaks. So already, you are removed from the actual uh, insight that he had. Then the listener has to kind of keep that oral tradition going and writing commentaries. We are again removed a little bit more from the original insight. Then we translate it into English, even more removed yeah, from, the, from the original insight. Because English language is never going to perfectly express what we have in Pali. I think the, the uh, translations we have now are pretty good. I mean, I'm a translator of Pali myself, so I, oh, I can't really say anything else. Uh, I, I guess I can, but I... But I <laughs> So they're pretty good, but there are also limitations. Yeah? Whenever you see something, we don't really fully comprehend the language that was used at that time. The language of the Buddha is often a language that is full of kind of what called words that relate to the spiritual technology. I don't know if technology is the right word, but the spiritual culture of that time. It's a very spiritual culture at the time of the Buddha. Meditation was very big, lots of debates about the meaning of life and what is important and all of these kind of things. And they had specialized words yeah, for meditation, for example, words like jhana, words like samadhi. And of course, words like jhana and samadhi are not really translatable into English. English doesn't have words like that. Yeah, there is very little. I mean, what is the closest in English language that you come to samadhi? Maybe something like Unification with God, maybe? Yeah, because that is kind of samadhi, right? You kind of you bliss out and you call it unification with God. But if you, call, if you translate samadhi with unification with God, you're giving just slightly the wrong impression. <laughs> yeah, it's completely the wrong impression. It doesn't work because that is in a Christian context. But arguably, it is a similar kind of attainment or achievement in a sense. And so, uh, yes, so you can see that there are linguistic uh, problems and linguistic limitations. But uh, if you do study the suttas, uh, and if you read quite broadly, you see the same things from different angles, uh, you start to hone in on the meaning of these teachings, uh, and you start to understand what is going on. Uh, so it's not a lost cause. Uh, yeah? It is not impossible to achieve these things in the present day. There are still people in the present day who become stream enterers and even enlightened. And certainly people who achieve deep samadhi, that is still you know, quite common. So uh, please don't uh, think that this is a lost cause. Uh, that would be uh, the wrong uh, uh, lesson to take away from this. So, uh, yes, so good enough, I would say, our understanding of the suttas. Let's go on to the next one. Ah, this is a same handwriting. Ah, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll put that one to one side. <laughs> so, uh, it's, yeah, sometimes people think that they are anonymous, but actually not anonymous because I recognize the handwriting. I know, yeah, this is awesome. <laughs> okay. Dear Arjan, how can I practice compassion with wisdom on myself first, then others? <clears throat> okay, so the, one of the important things about having compassion for yourself, one of the problems is that we live in a society that likes to blame people, yeah? 
and people will blame you and they will say that to you, you know, say, put you down and kind of things. And if you believe too much in what the world says to you about you, you will never really be happy yeah? because the world will always kind of say bad things. So ask yourself instead, what would Ajahn Brahm say to you? Would Ajahn Brahm put you down? Would Ajahn Brahm say bad things about you? What would the Buddha say about you? Would Buddha say to kind of come to you and say bad things that you are a terrible person and thing? Probably not, right? The Buddha would probably encourage you. Ajahn Brahm would encourage you. Ajahn Brahm doesn't say bad things about anyone almost. I never, I never really hear him say bad things about people. And so who, whose opinions matter? Yeah, we, often we listen to the opinions of people who haven't got a clue. The reason why other people say bad things about you and you kind of feel bad about yourself often is because of their own kind of bad feelings inside. Yeah, because they are having a bad day. but nothing to do with reality. So we need to forget about what other people say. Even if they praise us, it doesn't really matter so much. Instead, ask yourself, what would the Buddha say to me? And if the Buddha would kind of say, you're, you're doing well, you're going to carry on, that is what matters. So first thing is to get out of this judgment that other people may make, make about us, because actually it is quite irrelevant what other people think. They are, people don't know what's going on. And people will praise you and blame you for completely irrelevant matters. Yeah? They will praise you. Yeah, okay, you won the lottery. Wow, well done. You chose that number really well. Really? Okay. <laughs> or you do something kind of, or, or you do something at work and your boss praises you. Is that because it is really worthy of praise? No, it's because it helps the company. That's why he praises you, right? It's got nothing to do with anything important. And then they will blame you for things that are irrelevant. You didn't work hard enough, yeah? But actually, you were really kind to your fellow workers. What is it that really matters? And so often, all of this blame and praise, praise and blame is kind of utterly beside the point. And what matters is what kind of quality qualities we have as human beings. That is what matters. So put that aside first of all. That's number one. Number two, to have compassion for yourself, is to understand exactly the thing I was mentioning before, the idea that we are conditioned as human beings. Yeah, often we blame ourselves. We judge ourselves really harshly. I wasn't kind enough. I didn't do the right thing. Yeah, we always remember the bad things that we have done. We never remember the good things that we have done, even though we've done lots of good things. We always remember the bad stuff, and then we blame ourselves, and we are down on ourselves. But actually, you don't have much choice very often. The reason why sometimes you uh, kind of miss out, you kind of don't follow the Noble Eightfold Path fully, is because you have no choice. Yeah, this is your, these are your habits. This is your past coming through. What is wonderful and what is marvelous is that you have so many good habits. That is what is marvelous. That was amazing. That is really worth celebrating. The fact that you have bad qualities, of course you have bad qualities. You're born into the human realm. You get conditioned by all of the things around you. How could you not have some bad qualities? It would be a miracle if you didn't have them. Instead, praise yourself for having some at least a tiny few good qualities. Yeah, I did say something really nice 10 years ago. Okay, good. Well done. So you, you are happy about the good things in your life. And you understand how conditioned you are. The problem for us as human beings is that it feels like we have an ability to make choices. It feels like we have an ability to do different things than what we're actually doing. But that feeling, that sense of being autonomous and being independent of the world, that is a delusion. That is the whole point of Buddhism, the idea of non-self. And we are not really autonomous. Yeah, we are trapped by habits and past and all of these kind of things. And because we are trapped by these things, please have compassion for yourself. Of course you make mistakes. And the extraordinary thing is that if you have compassion for yourself, instead of judging yourself, you will make more progress. People often come to me and they say to me that, well, if I don't judge myself... I will not get any better. I won't make any progress. But I've got to judge myself really harshly because then I will have the motivation to work yeah, and to kind of change myself. No, it's the other way around. If the moment you judge yourself, you don't really understand what is going on. The moment you judge yourself, your mind becomes biased. You have like an ill will towards yourself. And that biased mind is not really able to see what is going on. So don't judge yourself. Yeah? Instead, accept yourself. Okay, this is me. This is my background. This is how I have been conditioned into this life. Yeah? Now, okay, have compassion for myself. 
and then try to understand what is going on. Okay, these are the cause, these are the conditions. This is why I reacted in this way. Okay, how can I change this? Okay, I need to look at this person with also with more compassion. Yeah, okay, they made a mistake, but that's okay. People make mistakes. And then you start to understand how you get out of your own bad habits, not by judging yourself, but by having compassion for yourself and trying to understand the causes. If you judge yourself and then try to use willpower to become a better person, which is what almost everyone does, it never works. It never really gives any results in the long run. Maybe once or twice you kind of change a little bit, then you're back to the same problem again soon enough. So this is how to have compassion for yourself, exactly the same way you have compassion for others. Understand your limitations. Understand you can't really do that. Yes, I spoke in the wrong way. Okay, it's all right. Yeah, this happens. This is what life is like. Okay, how can I avoid it in the future? So um, that is uh, what I recommend. So see how you go and uh, see what happens. So let's go on to the next one. Dear Ajahn, it's difficult to have karuna in the fourth situation about getting rid of resentment, especially when one is hurt badly. Also, if cause and conditions of the mind are not supportive, to see beyond the hurt caused by that person uh, is difficult to have sympathy. So how to go about, uh, uh, if Ajahn, as on one hand, guilt also arises because I know that person is clueless about her actions, uh, but the pain caused is really deep. Uh, go about it, yeah. So again, you know, the, the, the trick here is really this idea of not making it personal, yeah? The reason why you feel really hurt, because it feels personal. They are doing it to you. Yeah? But actually, they're not really doing it towards you. That's kind of the point. They are doing it because of the cause and conditions. And they would do it to another person if that other person was in your place. Yeah, They are not really so concerned about you or other people. What they are concerned about is their own inner feeling that somehow they feel they need to express in one way or another. That is what is really going on. And so you need to understand that. So you can imagine that, uh, imagine that this person is doing the same thing to someone else. Yeah. And then kind of see, make it into a third person thing rather than into a first person thing. So it is no longer you. Yeah. So imagine them doing exactly the same to some other person and another person. And it's not really you. It is just person in general. This is the way they are. And as you depersonalize it in that way, and you understand that this is coming from them, then, of course, it doesn't hurt so much anymore. Yeah, so you might still get a bit upset if they behave badly towards someone else, but it's only a very small thing compared to what it feels like when they behave badly towards you. So you have to try it again and again and again. Yeah? And after a while, even, you know, it starts to hurt less. And occasionally, you will still lose it. Occasionally, you will still not really succeed in that, but occasionally, you will succeed. And the first time you succeed, you think, wow, it's working. Yeah, because you don't actually suddenly, it doesn't affect you in the same way anymore. And that's kind of extraordinary. And then you get really, you get this feeling of a, a boost of energy because you see the Dhamma actually working in practice. So it's never about you. You have to get out of the kind of me kind of view, world view where everything is about me, me, me. It's not about you. It's about much larger things than that. And once you see that, then you can actually start to react appropriately towards other people. It's very beautiful when that happens, because then you kind of look at them and you're kind of puzzled. You puzzle, wow, what's happening with this person? How come they're acting like this? Wow, I feel really sorry for them. Yeah, if you act like this towards me, I'm a good person, actually. You know, why are you acting like this towards me? It's not recommended. Yeah. <laughs> And this is what you feel because you know in your heart that you are a good person. Yeah, you are doing the right thing. And then you kind of, you feel, have the security about yourself. So this is kind of the idea here. All right. So let's move on to the next one. Here, Ajahn. Sukitos. Okay, yesterday you explained, okay, briefly about the three factors regarding dependent origination, but you spoke so fast, I missed it completely. 
Is it possible to share the exp and explain it again, if you don't mind? Thank you so much, Sajjan. Regards and may God bless you. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to explain it until I read that last sentence, and then I'm not so sure. <laughs> Just for your information, I'm a Buddhist. Yeah? <laughs> uh, okay, anyway, so that's, that's okay. So um, I'm not sure which, which God you have in mind, but anyway, we'll just... Uh, <laughs> so, um, okay, very, very briefly. So... Um, uh, according to uh, independent origination, yeah, the ideas, the three factors that you see that we looked at yesterday is uh, the six senses. Yeah? And from the six senses, the six senses are both the internal senses, the internal ones are like the eye and the ear, etc. And then the external things, which are the objects. Yeah? So these are the six senses. And from that, you have contact. Yeah, consciousness is already given because consciousness is all, always there when you are exists. Consciousness is always around the corner. So these things, uh, yeah, the external senses, the internal ones, uh, come together and there's contact. Yeah, see, object, eye, contact, uh, and then contact means just an experience. Yeah, whenever there is an experience, that is contact in the sense you experience the world through the six senses, uh, and uh, then from that contact, whenever there is an experience. Uh, one of the aspects of that experience is feeling. Yeah? Either you enjoy it, or you don't enjoy it, or it's neutral. There are three kinds of experiences. And so this is, in many ways, the core of dependent origination, because this is where, um, and then from that feeling, then craving arises. If you don't like it, you want to reject it. If you like it, you, you want more of it. And this is how craving comes about. And that craving is the driver of the whole rebirth process. And so that, that is why this particular part of dependent origination is very interesting. Yeah? And so how we react to those feelings, uh, yeah, that is kind of critical. Yeah? And if you are fully enlightened, you will not react to those feelings with craving. That's the difference between the enlightened person and the unenlightened person. And it doesn't lead to rebirth. Yeah? And our job is to learn to react to the feelings of the world differently. Yeah? Even change the feelings. Yeah? Change the feelings by having more compassion and these kind of things. Yeah? So I'm, I apologize. I cannot speak very slowly. That is outside of my remit. That's impossible for me. Yeah, I always have a certain speed, and you, you're going to have to deal with that. Uh, so uh, I apologize. Uh, <laughs> so uh, anyway, so that is kind of just a very brief explanation. We have done the courses here before at the BGF on the whole of dependent origination. They're all twelve sequences and going over ten days, I think, yeah, just on that particular subject. Uh, so you can listen to that if you're interested. Uh, but that gives you a, just a very brief uh, view of what's happening here. Uh, <clears throat> okay, dear Ajahn, I appreciate very much you can clarify the following. What is the significance of the special relationship between consciousness and name and form? What is Adinasana Vinara? I actually should be Anidasana Vinara, but anyway, you got it roughly right. What is the meaning of the Dhamma is visible here and now? Is the extinction of craving Nibbana? Wow, this, this, this is someone who's really getting into the deep end. Let me put that one to one side, because uh, let's see if we have some straightforward questions, first of all, and we, we come back to those in a second. Dear Ajahn, are Pachitya Rule 10 and 11 of not digging the earth and damaging plants minor rules? Are these rules only sensible to people of ancient times? Is there any moral repercussions if these rules are broken? Thank you very much for your translation there. Um, are they minor rules? Well, they, it depends what you mean by minor. But in the Vinaya, they are called kudaka. They're part of the kudaka rules, and kudaka means minor. And the only major rules, uh, the rules of the Patimoka, are divided into garu, garu kapati and lahu kapati. Garu means heavy, lahu is light. Yeah? It's almost like English, lahu light. Uh, so light offenses and heavy offenses, uh, and these are part of the light offenses, and therefore the minor ones. Uh. So they are not super duper important, and there are lots of exemptions in those offenses. Uh. So there are lots of uh, times when they not, don't actually apply. Um, are they sensible to people of ancient India only? Uh, um, 
it's, it's a very interesting thing whether it is wrong to uh, you know dig the earth and kill the plant is it really is it fundamentally wrong to do that uh, and the reason the buddha lays down or he says for uh, laying down these rules uh, is that people at the time believe that plants is a one sensed faculties they have one sense and that one sense is a sense of touch and they have the same belief for the earth for the ground as it has a sense of touch so when you cut it you are damaging a one sensed being yeah this is one of the reasons why it was laid down but even in the in now in uh, kind of the um, uh, research that is done in these days regarding plants, uh, this seems to be that plants actually have some rudimentary form of consciousness. Yeah, we have we haven't really thought that for centuries, but now it seems to be that there is something going on with plants. Uh, they seem to be able to uh, have some sense of what is going around them. Uh, so maybe they do have a rudimentary form of consciousness. Yeah, I think it is still an open question. I think we don't really know properly whether that's the case or not. Uh, and that kind of opens up the possibility maybe there is a slight comma involved with killing plants. I don't think it is very serious because otherwise it would have been a made a rule also for lay people. Perhaps it would have been a rule for monastics in a different way. The Buddha never really says it is bad comma. So um, uh, I don't think the comma consequences are uh, are great, uh, even if there is any comma consequences at all. Uh, but is there any repercussions for breaking these rules? Well, as a monastic, if you are a monastic, you're supposed to keep the rules of the Patimokkha, but you shouldn't ideally not break those rules. And if you break them anyway, then there will be probably a tiny moral repercussion, probably not too great because it is a minor rule, but ideally you shouldn't do that. One of the ideas of being a monastic is that you, you have an obligation to keep the rules of the Patimokkha. That is kind of the deal you make when you become a monastic. Um, all right. Dear Ajahn, I feel more confused after these two days of Sutta retreat. If this world cannot bring us happiness, then what do I do while I am in this world? For the past two years, I've been feeling stressed and tired because work has been so tiring and busy. I've been chased by deadlines and long to-do lists, yet I cannot find purpose and meaning. Exactly. You are getting it, I think. I yearn to contribute to others and practice right livelihood. Is monkhood the only way? <laughs> um, <laughs> it, is, it is not the only way. Uh, and uh, remember at the time of the Buddha as well, there were lots of people who uh, practiced the Dhamma really well who were lay people. Uh, it is not the only way. I'm sorry to hear that you are more confused. Uh, what I would say is that uh, uh, the purpose of the things that I have been saying, yeah, if this world cannot bring you happiness, the whole purpose of these things uh, is to try to turn your mind in a slightly different direction. Yeah? What is really important in life? Uh, and remember, this does not mean that you actually need to change very much. You don't need a different job. You don't need a different family. You don't have to become a monk necessarily. Yeah, you can if you want to. You don't have to, or become a nun or whatever it might be. Yeah, of course, if you want to become a monk, I should happily oblige. <laughs> no, I cannot really do that myself, but uh, we, you know, this can be arranged, as they say. Um, uh, but uh, you can practice, uh, yeah, in ordinary life. What matters is not so much what you do, but how you do it. That is the critical thing. Yeah? And so when you live your ordinary life at work or uh, in your family life or whatever, you do it in the right way. That is what, what is important. Uh, now, you can live your ordinary life at work just being greedy, just wanting money, just wanting status. And then you die. You have to give everything up. And you ask, what was the point? You have to give it up anyway, right? Uh, that's kind of a crazy way of living. It's very short-sighted. Uh, or you can kind of think, actually, what? Matters is not so much the money or even meeting the deadlines or if I get fired. If I get fired, okay, fine. Unless you depend on your job, which then it can be much more difficult, of course. But uh, what is matters is how you do that job. How do you treat your co-workers? How do you treat your customers? Yeah, how do you treat your family members? You treat them with kindness. That is where the spiritual path really happens. It happens in our daily engagement with the world around us. And it does not have to happen in monastic life. 
And this is kind of beautiful because that means that everything in your life can become an aspect of the spiritual practice. Isn't that kind of great? There's something very beautiful about that. So make everything part of your spiritual practice. I hear what you're saying about being very tired and stressed, and I'm sorry to hear that because that is, uh, uh, of course, that is going to make things worse because if you are stressed and tired, then maybe you get a bit grumpy, and when you get a bit grumpy, then uh, things get even more difficult and it's hard to find purpose and meaning. Uh, so try to see if you can de-stress. Yeah? What can you do to become less stressed? How can you make life less busy in some ways? Maybe you can cut back on certain things. Maybe just sleep a little bit more, right? Isn't that nice? Sleep a little bit more. Huh? Yeah, don't worry about meditating or doing anything else. Just sleep a little bit first of all. The first step on the Noble Edful Path, more sleep. <laughs> And it's true, right? It is not bad, because what does that first step mean? If you can sleep more, you are less tired, it means that you will have more energy. It means that your mind will be clearer to do what is right. It means that um, you're having self-compassion because you're allowing yourself to sleep. One of the first things I would recommend, put away that blooming mobile phone. It is one of the most evil inventions in human history. It is really bad, right? It is so destructive. And at the very least, in the evening, at a certain time, when 8 o'clock in the evening or whatever, put it away, lock it up, and don't bring it up until at least one hour after you wake up in the morning. Don't have it on the next to your bed when you sleep. Put it far away. Yeah? Put it on the roof of your house. <laughs> That's what I recommend. It is an evil invention. Yeah? It drains so much energy. It it is it's destructive. And the worst thing of all is that these terrible technology companies in Silicon Valley, this is the fault of the Americans. They are... <laughs> they purposely do these things to hook us on these things, right? Because they know, because they, they just want more advertisements, they want more money, and it's a whole crazy kind of thing. I don't know why we allow ourselves to be used by these technology companies. That's basically what we're doing. So put it away. Throw that mobile phone in the nearest river, yeah, whatever that might be. Get rid of it once and for all. <laughs> these are terrible things. And these are probably more destructive of our life and make us more tired than many, many other things. So get your priorities right, yeah? Try to chuck out some of the things that are very destructive and then start to do things that are, are kind of more useful. Sleep a little bit extra. You know, have good meals, have some regular, have quality time with your family, yeah? These kind of things. And then gradually, gradually bring things back on track again. So, um, yeah, the modern life is kind of, uh, I don't know, sometimes we think that we are advanced. Sometimes I think that we are really back in the Stone Age, to be honest. Uh, and we are really stupid in the modern, the modern world. Uh, and, uh, yeah, we have all of this technology, but we are less and less wisdom, it seems, sometimes. Uh, Kind of terrible. Um, so, it is already 20 minutes past five. I have this very profound question about uh, various kind of things. I will answer that question tomorrow because there's so many issues with this question that I probably will take a little bit of time. So let me put that to one side. Let's just do a little bit of meditation together before we call it a day here. Yeah.